discussed is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a woman phoning about the shared house she is going to move into. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello? Hello, this is Hilary. I'm calling about the house. I'm moving in next week. Oh yes, Hilary. This is Judith. I met you when you came to look at the house. Yes. I just had a few more questions I wanted to ask. Of course. Well, first, about the rent. I realise I didn't check what it included. Yes, that's important. It includes most things. We don't have to pay extra for heating, for example, just for the telephone, which is fair enough, I suppose. Local taxes are part of the rent, so that's not a worry. That's fine. Then I remember I should have sent my letter of reference to the landlord by now, but I haven't got his address. Yes, you should get that off right away. Address it to Mr Crawley. He's at 14 King Street. Is that in Exford? Yes. And then you'll need to put the postcode, of course. It's AP12 mm -hmm. 7QT. Got that. Thanks. I also realise I don't know exactly what the house has in the way of equipment. Is there a microwave, for example? There isn't. None of us feels the need. Oh, fine. I'm sure I can do without one, too. What about a hairdryer? Maybe you should bring one, if you need one. I'll buy one, yes. And TV? Oh, yes. We've got two, in fact. Was there anything else? I just wondered if there were any rules. Not really. We share the cleaning, things like that. We do have to be careful about loud music. Yes. So we've agreed that there shouldn't be any loud music after nine and that we don't play music at all in the living room after ten. Up to eleven in your own room's OK, as long as it's not too noisy. That sounds good. And is there somewhere safe I can keep my bike? That's difficult. To be honest, Lots do get stolen round here. We haven't got a garage, so we tend to park ours in the garden so that they're hidden from the street. OK. Now, I hope you like cooking. Yes, I do. Do you all have shared meals? Not very often, actually. But when the weather's good in the summer, we like to have a barbecue together, which we do each Wednesday. We tend to go out at weekends. Sounds fun. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Are you familiar with this area? A bit. Actually, there are a few things that I'd like to know the location of. A bank, for example. Yes, there's one quite close. You just go up to the junction near the house, the one where four roads meet, and go straight ahead and then take the second left. It's a little way down there on the left-hand side. That's convenient. Another thing is that I'd like to check my emails quite often. I was wondering how far away an internet cafe was. Well, there are a couple, actually, but one's much cheaper than the other. The one I use is very handy. You just go up to the big junction and then... Well, I go straight ahead and then turn right so that it's on the right-hand side. Fine. And one last thing. Uh-huh. 
I need to go to the post office quite often. I'm hoping there's one quite close to the house. You're in luck. You'd walk up to the big junction, and then, if you want a nice route, take the street that's slightly to the right. Then you'd want the second left, and you'd find it on the right side of the street. Well, it all sounds great. So, we'll see you in a couple of days' time. Yes. Okay. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a radio interview about a lakeside resort. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon and welcome to today's show. The warm months are with us and many of you are getting ready to plan vacation trips. To help you with that, we have a special guest today, Robert Sampson, director of the Golden Lake Resort. Robert. I understand Golden Lake is a popular place for families to spend their vacations. Yes, families enjoy spending time at Golden Lake. Many come back year after year. We have a spectacular location and fun activities for both children and adults. Could you describe for us some of the activities available at Golden Lake? We have a lot of water activities, of course, since we're right on the lake. We have a pleasant sandy beach for swimming. We also have canoes and sailboats available, and many of our guests enjoy boating on the lake. I imagine water skiing would be popular among your guests. Actually, we don't permit water skiing in the resort area. It can be dangerous for swimmers and for the canoeists too. We do have a great location for fishing though, and you'll often see guests fishing from our dock or from the canoes. That sounds very relaxing. What about activities on land? Do you have facilities for tennis? We had tennis in the past, but the courts fell out of repair, and since we found that most of our guests weren't interested in the game, we closed the courts down. So that's no longer an option. And naturally, because of our location in the woods, we don't have an adequate area for a golf course. But I'd like to let your listeners know that we'll be adding a new activity this year. We've made an arrangement with the local stable, so now we're going to have horseback riding available for our guests. We've created several riding trails around the lake. That sounds lovely. Now, what about rainy days? What can your guests do when the weather's bad? We have a games room and a crafts room. When the weather's rainy, some of our very talented staff members offer arts and crafts classes for all ages. What fun! Do you offer any other classes or activities? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. We have a weekly schedule of evening activities which anyone can attend if they choose. Every Sunday we show a film, always something that's suitable for the whole family. Monday's my favourite night because that's dessert night. Our cook prepares a variety of desserts and we get to taste them all. Mmm, I'd like to be there for that. Yes, it's great. We get more serious toward the middle of the week. Our discussion night is on Tuesday. Discussion night? Yes, we discuss different current events, depending on what's happening that week in the news. Then on Wednesdays, we have lectures. We invite different experts to talk about local history or nature topics. This is actually one of our most popular evening activities. We found that our guests are really interested in learning about the local area. It sounds quite interesting. Yes, we've had some excellent speakers. Thursday nights are totally different, because that's when we play games. That's especially fun for the children. The children love Fridays too, because that's talent show night. Everyone gets in on that. Staff, guests, everyone. It looks like you have a lot of fun at Golden Lake Resort. We do. And we end every week with big fun, with a dance on Saturday night. Now I understand a little more why Golden Lake is such a popular place for family vacations. With such a variety of activities, there's something for every member of the family there. There is, and I hope your listeners will consider spending their next vacation with us. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk given by Kate Tomalin on the history of technology. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Our talk today in this History of Technology series is about a feat of anti-engineering from the late 19th and early 20th century that is still very much with us today and that is linked with the history of the typewriter. It's the QWERTY keyboard. What you might ask is QWERTY. Well, have a look at the nearest typewriter or computer keyboard. If you look at the top row, you will see that Q, W, E, R, T, Y are the first six letters. Did you ever think when you were learning to type about why the letters on the keyboard are distributed the way they are? Here's the story. It all has to do with the history of the typewriter. Typewriters existed since the early 1700s, but the first commercially practical system came into being in 1873. The typewriter is one of America's greatest unsung inventions. While the telephone, automobile, and airplane sped up communications and transportation, the typewriter did the same thing for the written word. But few people paid much attention possibly because they were too busy reading what the typewriter had written about all the other inventions. The first typewriters had the keys laid out in alphabetical order, but this system had problems. Some keys that tended to be typed together were physically close. This made the type bars hit each other and get stuck. Typewriters in 1873 jammed or got stuck if the keys next to each other were hit in quick succession. To solve this problem, in 1878, the QWERTY keyboard was developed, spacing frequent letters away from each other and therefore reducing the number of jams.
It was not specifically designed to slow down typists, as is generally believed, but the keyboard did create a built-in inefficiency for typists. The most common keys are scattered all over the keyboard rows, many on the left side. Right-handed people have to use their left hand, which is the weaker hand. Typewriter technology improved, doing away with the original rationale for the QWERTY distribution, but the keyboard remained. In spite of its inefficiency, it is the keyboard we all use today. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Already back in 1932, there was a solution to the problem. Efficiency expert August Dvorak came up with a new keyboard layout. His home row consisted of A, O, E, U, I, D, H, T, N, S, which includes all of the vowels as well as the most commonly used letters. On this keyboard, over 3,000 words can be typed using only the home row. In fact, 70% of all the work can be done on the home row, 22% on the row above, and 8% on the row below. The QWERTY keyboard allows only about 50 words to be typed without reaching for other rows. In addition, on Dvorak's keyboard, the right hand handles 56% of the workload and the left handles 44%, just about the opposite of the division of the QWERTY keyboard. This is an advantage for most right-handers. The Dvorak keyboard increased accuracy in typing by almost 50% and speed by 15 to 20%. How much labor did this Dvorak layout save? In one study, a group of typists was evaluated in the use of both keyboards. Those using the Dvorak keyboard moved their fingers just about one mile on an average day, while those who used the QWERTY keyboard moved their fingers an average of 12 to 20 miles. The superiority of the Dvorak keyboard was clearly established. However, it has never been adopted as the keyboard of choice. Why? First of all, bad luck and bad timing on the part of the Dvorak team. First, there was the Depression. Not a good time for introducing change. But the main factor that worked against the Dvorak system was habit. People were used to the QWERTY keyboard. Computers today could easily switch the arrangement of letters to the Dvorak layout, but it seemed that because of habit, the QWERTY layout remains dominant. People felt comfortable with the keyboard they learned on, so it was the established patterns of hundreds of millions of typists, manufacturers, typing teachers, and typewriter salespeople that have crushed all moves toward keyboard efficiency for over 70 years. It looks like QWERTY Keyboard may be with us for a long time yet. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37.
Okay, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So, I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorized scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city, as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. 
But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... Any That is the end of part four. Check your answers.